This is the topology of the lab that we have here. Um, it's a very simple topology of two spines and four leaves. And you have two racks that are essentially connected to these. Um, we are connected to, uh, as you can see, there is a V-center that will show the integration V-center and being able to create the VLANs and so forth. But this is the physical topology. So Colin, if you can just advance to the next, to the next slide. So, OK. So here what Colin is showing you is he's actually going and you know, he's getting into the switches themselves. And he's going to be, one of the things you have to do to make a switch come under Smart Fabric Director is to change the mode, operating mode on the switch. And this, I want to just digress a little bit. Once you put a switch under Smart Fabric Director Management, we disable CLI that affects the configuration of the box. We do not, we want to have only one master for configs, which is SFD. I'm going to call SFD for Smart Fiber Director. So this basically makes sure that somebody can't go into CLI and accidentally shoot themselves in the foot and make some changes, right? How long did you guys have a discussion about that topic internally? Like, did that go on for a while? Like, we're going to make sure they don't touch the CLI, and we're going to build that into the product. Did you guys debate that for a while, or was that just an easy, easy thing for you to no, decide? No, there, there's a lot of debate. There's still debate, right? So the reason for that is, if you look at traditionally how network admins like to manage, they go into the box and make changes. So I mean, those, that's actually good. So if you're trying to debug a problem and you want to fix it immediately and bring the, bring the box back up line, that's probably the fastest way to do it. But longer term, I think what happens is these misconfigurations actually cause more problems than solve. So what we said is, OK, but, but we also realize that network admins like to monitor using CLI. So we have not disabled any of the show commands. Okay. So you can still get into the box and do any of the show run, show the running config, show BGP summary, show BGP neighbors, and so on and so forth. So that's all still allowed. <coughs> what, what we don't allow is for you to go and, for example, say, you know, change something in VRRP or change something in VLAN or change something in BGP that's going to affect the fabric. Right? So selectively, we have disabled. Again, I must admit, this is, there's some amount of religion here. So we want to tread carefully with respect to what we want to disable and enable. So we think we have done a good job in stopping the ones that will cause you to have any misconfiguration. But again, I think it's an iterative thing. So I, I think, think it was a bold decision. I, I, I applaud you for the bold decision to do that. Yeah, I mean, I think at the end of the day, we, like I said, we want to prevent misconfiguration. Yeah. So we had to take this decision. So it's a, to me, it's a dial. So if we go a little bit too far with how much we have disabled, we can backtrack and we can come back and, and let you guys, I mean, if, you, if the operator says, no, I need this configuration, we go, go back and look and bring it back. But anyway, it's going to be a little give and take with the operators, I think, yeah. Um, is that a one-way switch? So once you go in, you can't come back out? I mean, no. not that you would want the customer to exit using the product, yeah. but I'm just, if you, no, once you go in, question. how do you get out? If you, so let, that's a great question. So the way the switch operates is when it boots up initially, it comes in what is called a full switch mode, which is everything is allowed, everything done through CLI or REST or, you know, GNMI, whatever you want to do. <coughs> it, you then, when you transition into, then we have a couple of different modes. When you transition into a smart fabric mode, that's when you get into the state where we disable some CLI. You can always get out of it, right? So when you get out of it, you go back to what we call a startup config, which is basically what probably got shipped to you from factory. You can always then go back and you know put it back, any config that you want, and do the, I mean, bring up the switch and use it the way you want it. Yeah, it's not a one-way street. You can always go back, download something else that you want, and meaning take the switch out of SFD mode. Yeah. So following up on Jeremy's question, does the director, uh, does it go the other way? Can I can get in the director and I can take a look at the config for, you know, yes. leaf one spine? Or Absolutely. Spine? You, you, Actually, it, the way the director works is once you specify an intent, you, within the director GUI, you can go look at the config. Okay. It'll let you see what is actually going to go to the switch. And you can kind of look at it and say, yeah, I like it, I don't like it, and that kind of stuff. You can make all your changes before you deploy, what we call deployment, right? Okay. So before you deploy, you've got a way to look at VLANs, you've got a way to look at all the IP addresses are being assigned, the BGP config that's in there. And after you deploy, you can log into the switch, tell it into the switch and look at all the configs that you want. Yeah. I, so, I find that that's actually helpful because if you get a chance to take a look at the config before you push it into a, into a, a box, uh, yeah. I think that people would get 
a little sense of comfort out of that. Yeah, no, no worries. Yeah, I understand. So I maybe missed this, but it's probably and it probably does. But just to clarify, you this works with brownfield environments, so you can come in later with <coughs> with this product and okay. say, oh, yeah. You don't want to blow away half your. That's a great. To it's a great put question. This product in. Initial release of this is for greenfield, but we do understand that brownfield is where we need to support. We're looking at this with respect to how we can support burnfield. I understand that you have already have a data center and you have vCenter installations. You've got VLANs <coughs> to find, and you want to take those VLANs and extend it because you're you know maybe adding some capacity to the data center. So it is a. It's not in the first release that we have right now, but it's something we are looking at to be able to do that going okay. forward. Yeah, because I mean, as much as we all love greenfield deployments, you know, <laughs> the number of times we get to do that are very small, right? Yeah, we're, no, always, I, we're always I inheriting. I completely things. agree. It, it's, a, it, it's a challenge that I think we can solve, but it's in the ne next few Okay, so how, how are you handling that oh crap moment? Because <laughs> coming, coming from a wireless standpoint, there's manufacturers that do this where I add a controller into a group. Well, the master controls all that and I can't do anything on, just like you're saying here. So you misconfigure something, how do you go fix that if you've got the CLI completely locked down? How are you guys handling that? So the way we are handling it is you have to go back and change the intent with what the configuration is. So first of all- Well, if you lose, can, if, you, if you change a VLAN, for instance, and you completely You mean lose from the CLI? Yeah, well, no, from- from, oh, the, from 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 the controller. Oh, you can always and go back and change the, change well, the intent and re-employ. activity to the device, though, is what I'm getting at. Oh, you mean the device is not accessible right. to SFD? Okay, so let me let me. So that's a great question. Uh, Smart Fabric Director communicates the devices using a management network. Okay. We are we are out of band. So you're out. So okay. we are not we are not in band. Okay. Right. One of the challenges, in fact, a lot of people are actually asking us to support in band, but this challenge that you mentioned would be a problem. So if you go in band and you configure something wrong, right. All of a sudden you can't reach the net. You can't reach the device at all. So the decision we took is that we'll go out of band, okay. right, and have a separate management. So the creation of the management network is outside SFD school. Somebody has to go physically set up a management network right. and then connect everything together so that we always have a way to get into the box. Okay. Right? Yeah, go ahead. So I'm just curious why this wasn't something you just decided to make as a parameter within ONI and, and do zero touch provisioning just to enable this sort of feature in the beginnings. Because if you're deploying, like, let's say part of your fabric is cumulus, that wants to be able to use Oni to be able to bootstrap and be able to provide the right parameters for the cumulus boxes to come up. You got another portion of fabric you want to deploy using this. You basically are forcing everyone to then touch every single one of those switches as opposed to using the existing Oni or zero touch provisioning system you already have in play. Yeah, so um, this is a great question. In the first release this is what we're doing, but going forward, we will implement what we call auto discovery and zero touch provisioning, wherein all of this stuff would actually be automated through SFD itself. All you have to do is get an IP address from a DHCP server and add the IP address to SFD and it'll go ahead and do everything. You don't need to go set the mode and all this stuff. Right, so this is a first step that we have for the right. product, but the second version will completely automate this process wherein you have to do very little on the box itself. Yeah, you had a question? Oh, great, <laughs> sorry. Okay, so um, Colin, if you can go ahead and set the mode. <laughs> Uh, to Smart Fabric Director. All right, so I think he's highlighting. Um, so there's a CLI command. It's kind of hard to see here, but there's a CLI command called set, set fabric mode to Smart Fabric Director, and that's what changes the mode on the switch to be managed by SFT, right? So then we can, uh, Colin, if you can just move forward to the next step. Yeah. So I think he's just highlighting the places where the CLI, and he, we are also gonna show that there is no VLANs defined on the box, right? There's pretty much nothing on the box. All, it, all you have, the interface configs are all down. The ports, all that is enabled on the box at this time is the management VLAN. VLAN one is our management VLAN. That's the only, all the ports are basically listening on a management VLAN. Other than that, there's nothing configured on the box. This is just to show that when I'm done with the demo, you'll see all the user VLANs actually configured, right? All right. So what, what we are showing here is the vCenter uh, console. This is your vCenter console. And you're looking at all the hosts on the left side, I apologize again. But on the top left of the thing under SFD cluster, you basically have a bunch of hosts. So what is going to happen is he's going to make point SFD to the vCenter and 
the, all the host information is going to come and it's going to provision VLANs on the underlay network so that there's communication within the box. So <clears throat> Colin, go ahead. Okay, he's, he's just showing, um, at this point, basically, it's a vCenter GUI. It's going to be creating a bunch of port group information. You have VLANs. I think he's just highlighting the fact that you have VLAN ID 1613, 1612. Um, th that's a storage VLAN and a vMotion VLAN. We actually get that information from vCenter and make sure that the transport within the layer 3 fabric for those VLANs is enabled. Right? So that's part of what the platform does. OK. All right, so at this point, we're going to get into Smart Fabric Director. <coughs> uh, so it's going to log in. So Colin, if you can just pause for a second, I want to talk about the fabric. So the, the button that you see when you get into the product, it's called Import Fabric. So this is, again, a decision that we have right now. I talked about auto discovery. But right now, the way we do it is you have to define your wiring diagram within your data center using a JSON file. Essentially, you have to say, these are my switches. Uh, these are host names of the switches and the IP address and so on. But also the physical wiring connectivity that you have within your DC, right? W one of the design decisions we said is we need this product to be able to verify the physical wiring. Let's say you think that there's a physical connectivity between leaf one and spine two, but or there's the, you know, redundant links between um, the leaf and the spine, but I, in actually that link is not coming up or there's something misconfiguration, miswiring. This actually will point that out. So this is like saying, this is how I think my data center should look like. It goes and discovers the whole topology and it'll highlight where the errors are. Right? So it'll mark it saying that, you know, you think it is this, but it's not this. So you either you go fix it or you modify your intent to take what you have and so on. The other approach which I think the gentleman here was asking is, and we'll do that in the second release, is we don't care about the wiring. Just go take the existing wiring, discover what you have, and just configure the intent, right? Because that there's no check going on there. It's like you're relying on however it's been wired to it. So two questions. Yeah. Does that JSON data, data set include the optics that go into each of the interfaces? No, we don't actually include optics right now. We only tell the ports and the connectivity between the ports. So the JSON, what it specifies is each of the switches and the links between the switches and the, the leaves and the spines and the connection between the leaves for VLT. I think you guys are familiar. VLT is Dell's term for MLAG, right? So the VLT links between the leaves are specified. The host links are specified, and the and the interlinks are specified, but no optics. Having done a, a, a building install recently, uh, it's, it's a very common error to accidentally put in the wrong optics, like <laughs> LRs for SRs. And then when that happens, you get kind of weird link flappy stuff and it just, you know, things won't show up and you won't get your neighborship relationships and it's a real needle in a haystack type of problem. So um, having, having the intent of the optics on your ports would provide visibility into those, those common types of errors. I think that's a great suggestion. So we'll take that. I, I think we, we didn't think of that, but it sounds like it's something, if you're gonna check for misconfigurations in the physical capacity, that's a great thing to check, yeah. Is there a roadmap movie for just it all being auto-discovered and then you yes. look and see? Yes. So this is the first step where we take a physical wiring and then we check it for you. In the second release, we'll actually auto-discover and just take the existing wiring. At that point, there's no checking. It's just discover what is out there and go and configure, uh, create a topology. The, the second question was is, Sorry. do you only do this check when you import it or can you just say, you know, check again, check again? Like, let's say you're building out part of your fabric and then you want to build out like maybe a little bit more fabric, and then you want to build out a little bit more fabric. So go, can you can continue to audit the physical, uh, the, the physical plant of your fabric? So we will allow what is called re-importing of the fabric, right? So the right now, uh, and this is something that's coming in a few months from now, you can always change the JSON and re-import it. When you re-import it, it'll check it. When you re-import it, you can actually change the wiring and do some other stuff, and it's obviously going to go through the whole thing and check it again to make sure. So in, the answer is yes. Um, we put out an image of the product uh, end of last month, September. That one doesn't have the re-import, but the next one will have the ability to re-import a changed JSON or a changed wiring diagram. So when you say change, do you mean like I could just do a little small snippet of JSON versus the entire? No, no, no. JSON. you got to do the, you got to redo the JSON because the idea is you got to describe what we are allowing the import 
<laughs> is let's say you have your example of an optic going bad or, or a link not working. If you want to rewire the, the connectivity between two switches to a different port, that's the use case that we are that we are doing through the reim port, right? So you essentially have to show give the entire wiring diagram again. Okay. You, you make a few changes. We'll discover what the changes are, but you have to give it again. So it's not a add-on JSON. I think what you're saying is just to be able to re-import. I would rather do it through discovery, though. I think I see JSON as being a one-time thing where you import something, and the only reason to re-import is you've got some physical issues in your wiring and you want to fix them and you know kind of have a different wiring than what you had before. But going forward, if you want to add a node or if you want to add a link or you want to extend the data center for additional capacity, that's probably solved better through the auto discovery where you connect the node and we'll automatically go and discover it. I mean, that'll work in a lot of cases, but in the case where we have to make a cabling change, for example, and then a facilities crew is going to come in two or three days later to actually do that, and then you want to audit that they completed that work effectively, rediscovering you know, three days later doesn't necessarily say they did the job right. It's just going to show you what is currently plugged in, and so they could make yet another mistake. No, it's it's a good yeah. it's a good thing. So, if I can summarize, right? One was optics. And, uh, so I want to introduce. I have Bob's. Uh, he is VM. He's a product manager in VMware. He's my counterpart in VMware, who's helping develop it, uh, develop the product together. So, so Bob's. I think we should take some notes and probably uh, follow up with you if we can. Uh, both are good suggestions. Incremental JSON is one of the questions. The other is check optics, right? That's what he had. Okay, great. So. Uh, Colin was just showing, so this is an example, again, I apologize, you can't see the font very well, but it's uh, essentially this interlink is the connectivity between uh, you know, a leaf and a switch, right? So you got to define host links, interlinks, and what we call VLT links. These are for MLAG or MC, uh, uh, multi-chassis lag uh, to implement on the leaves, right? So Colin, we can just move forward. So, uh, I mean, as amazing as JSON is and everybody loves it, uh, more than YAML, perhaps. Um, do you have a tool that would take a spreadsheet and then generate that that file? Because you know, artisanally handcrafting JSON isn't fun, or writing custom programs isn't all that great. And it seems to be a common. I've got a spreadsheet, click button, you know, make cabling JSON file. Fantastic question. Yes, we do. We have a product called Fabric Design Center. Oh. Okay. We're gonna so see that. You can actually use it today. It's called fdc.emc.com, right? So if you go to that website. What it lets you do is actually create the wiring diagram for a physical <coughs> topology. So if you, go, if you go there, it'll say, what do you want to use for leaves? What switches you want to use for leaves? What switches you want to use for spine? You have to define, yeah, that, that's, the, that's the site. Uh, what, what, that essentially will create the JSON for you. You don't have to actually go and edit. What we are doing, though, is that that product doesn't quite support the JSON that SFD needs right now. So we are enhancing it to be able to create a wiring diagram that can import into this. But I'm thinking like maybe a month from now or six weeks from now, you will have the ability to create the JSON using FTC. But would you, would you package and sell that as like a studio, like put them together so people don't have to install two different systems and so forth? That's actually public. Yeah, it, you can go there and use it. Yeah. yeah it, it, go ahead. Sorry, chairman, you're good. Um, so yeah, so Fabric Design Center, I wrote the URL up here, so I'm the, one of the next speakers, but just real quick, this is an online tool. All you need to do is create an account with Dell EMC, uh, so you register your, your email address so we know who you are, and then it's, it's available and free today. So it's a SaaS application. Yes. As you go in there, you'll see also a number of sort of specific intents around certain configurations, like I'm deploying a vSAN stretch cluster, or I'm deploying a VxRail, or maybe it's uh, some other software-defined storage, so we give you places to start or you can design a fabric from the ground up. But the idea is, at the end of it, you get an output of, here's my wiring diagram, here's the con specific configuration details, here's also actually a bill of material, inclusive of the cables and optics, by the way, um, to make it yep. easier once I've designed that to, to know what I need to get. Fantastic. Yep. Yeah, so please check Great. it out. Thank you, yeah, check it out. Thank you, Drew. Okay, Colin, let's go ahead and import the fabric. Loading. So Colin has already created a JSON. He's going to open it. So at this point, what SFD is doing is it's importing the fabric, right? And it's going to go put up a diagram and I'm wait for it to finish. OK. So Colin, if you can just stop here, right? So what you're seeing here is you're seeing all the nodes grayed out with all the links being dotted. That means that it's read the JSON, right? It knows what the links need to be. But they're not discovered yet. Right? 
So it starts a discovery in the background. So if you see the one on the top, it says the wiring diagram import is completed. What it means is that it, it knows what the topology should look like. It will initiate a discovery in the background. But you can go ahead and create an intent. And you can go through the, so it's kind of like, you know, uh, multitasking, if you will. While the discovery is going on, you go and create an intent of what you want to deploy under that fabric. Before it actually deploys, it will update the diagram. In this case, actually, before I could speak, it actually verified that all the switches and all the links are actually active and they've come up. That's why you see them as solid, right? So the, so the graying, I mean, it's become darker gray, and then the links have become that. Now, what he's going to, what Colin is doing is he's setting up a fabric template. You see the three template types. He's choosing layer three BGP fabric, no, right? I'm, I'm talking about him and me. Yeah. And then saying next. Like 10 minutes. So this is what I meant by the minimum input required to create a BGP fabric. All he, what he's doing is specifying the prefixes that you want to use for loopback IP and the interlinks, and the ASN numbers that you want to use for BGP on the leaves and spines. <coughs> Once you do that, Essentially, that's the only config that you want to do. And in the advanced setting, there are some uh, things that you can tweak, like, for example, uh, UFD. And RSTP doesn't apply here. But you can, uh, you can tweak a few of the other things, whether you want uh, uplink failure detection or not, um, and things like that. But other than that, most of the config is like you know, predetermined and ready to go. Go ahead, Colin. OK. At this point, he's going to add a vCenter um, server information. OK. So here, the vCenter basically tells it to go pull the port group information from vCenter. But you have to add the VLANs that you want to actually connect between the leaf pairs that you want to enable within the network to do this. So this is kind of like saying, yes, you know, you're getting some VLANs from, from uh, vCenter, from a port group information. But that needs to be corroborated and say that I actually want to enable these VLANs within your network, right? So this is that step. So you essentially give your VRRP addresses for routing and so on. Uh, but once you do that, so basically he's going to go through and create some VLANs. Uh, I'll just let him finish. It's a storage VLAN. So these are the infrastructure VLANs that VMware needs, for example, the vSAN VLAN and the vMotion VLAN and so on. So that's what he's going through at this point and setting up the routing for those VLANs. By the way, it's, the GUI is one way to do this. But if you've got a large number of VLANs, obviously you might want to use an API. It's much easier to get it all set up a lot quicker using the API than GUI. So it's a question of how you want to operationalize this product. Both ways are equally, I mean, they work equally well. What kind of tools do you provide that allows network engineers to take advantage of an API if they're not programmers? Like, do you have like Ansible modules or Postman uh, kind of collections or things that let people use the API without being hardcore programmers? Uh, right now, I mean, there's, we got to, going forward, I think we'll provide something. Right now, the product doesn't have any, but it's a good question. I think we got to think about that, how to make it more. Programmable. I mean, a lot of the customers that I see, the initial ones, um, will probably end up using GUI. Again, it depends on how much work you need to do. If you have hundreds of VLANs, I assume API is the way to go. It's just too cumbersome to use GUI. But we can. Um, we don't have it right now, but we can provide some. Sorry, I didn't interrupt. I'm going to plug for the URL I wrote up here on the board for your question. Because... <laughs> Turn your microphone on. Yeah. Sure. Okay. okay. Um, so, um, if you go in here and design a fabric in here, one of the options of the output is as well an Ansible playbook. Yeah. So we are trying to really focus on enabling that that level of you know you know touch and go in terms of people who want to embrace that as the way we want to do configuration management. So again, go play around with it, create playbook. Yep. It's a great place to go. All right, Thanks. Cool. thank you, Drew. Okay, so okay, really quick, you, you, we had a couple questions come up. Yep. Sure. About your dire, you, you had your wiring diagram up there. Yeah. And it looked like you had connections between leafs that's the vlt link that's the vlt link that's your multi chassis lag that is your lag yeah see okay. so we implement what is called a multi chassis lag so you you if you have so essentially a host would be connected to two leaves and there's a there's a connection between the leaves so if the one of the links from the host to one of the leaves fails and it goes to the other but the path could take it across that interlink and so why was that decision made to do, you know, basically, M lag with, you know, leaves. 
well, opposed to that's our reference architecture for data center today we we basically have redundant paths from the host to the leaves and from leaves to the spines is actually ecmp so there's no m lag there but there's an m lag from the host to the leaves itself that that's how we are actually doing our data center reference design okay. now you don't have to do it meaning that you can if you have routing within the host which can take care of multi paths through the network then you can in fact i think vmware in some of their reference architectures say that you don't implement a vlt or, or an mlag at the leaf layer you essentially provide let nsx or something else decide what path they want to take through the network they'll just be given two paths so I assume that, I mean, the architecture, the reference architecture for MLAG and all that, that's, I mean, I assume documented somewhere. It is well documented. You okay. can get our data center reference you can architecture. kind of read the background that. on that. Yeah, absolutely. Why? Yeah, we can provide that. Okay. Yep. Yeah, I'd be interested in seeing that. Sure, no problem. Any other questions on here or on the web? Okay. So I'm curious, who are your, um, so who is this targeted tour and towards and what problem are you trying to solve? The customers that you guys are working with on this, what did they come to you with and what are you, what are you hoping to solve with this product? Okay, so great question. So this is what the problem essentially we're trying to solve is make it extremely easy. One use case is customer wants to deploy, let's say, NSX and he's got a virtualization which is based on vCenter. Take the, automate the underlay to, to the extent where they never have to CLI into the box at all. That's number one use case. Eventually, where we want to get to is that the underlay is almost invisible, right? Everything is done through Smart Fabric Director. It manages the underlay, and you are essentially communicating through the NSX console or some other virtualization console, if you will, and everything is hidden from you to make it easy, right, for you to manage your complete network. The other use case is if you do not have an overlay or you want to deploy some other overlay, for example, a BGP VPN, which is an alternative to, say, an SX type overlay, this can automate that as well. And you want, to, you want to provide the same level of fabric automation to be able to do that and configure this. And lastly, we also want to address the issue of troubleshooting, monitoring, debugging. That's where I think most of the future value of this product is going to be, is once you have configured, how do you operationalize this? And essentially, in, in one sentence, if I can summarize, we want to bring the operational excellence from public clouds to private clouds. So people are, I think, in general, very tuned to the way public clouds enable them to deploy workloads and applications and all of that. We want to bring the same operational models and excellence into private clouds. Okay. So will you be showcasing some of the troubleshooting and, and telemetry visibility uh, today? Uh, not today, but we can. Obviously, if, if you're interested, we can have a webinar or something where we can go through that. Yeah, today we kind of have, we're wearing two hats. One is SFD, the other is SD-WAN, and I want to you know, make sure that you get enough time to look at what we have in SD-WAN and the Edge portfolio as well. Okay, Colin, so if you can just yeah, hit the next. So what he's done is he's created all the VLANs for transport. Um, if you can pause for a second, I just want to describe. You see how the color changed to blue? Blue means that the switch is actually provisioned, meaning that there is a config ready to go onto the switch. That's what blue means. All the gray lines mean, obviously, they're not the dotted, but the solid gray means that the connections have come up. Okay, and the next steps. Oh, you want to? Yeah, in the interest of time, Colin, let's just go for the next step. Okay, so this step where you submit for approval, if you can pause for a second, Colin. So we actually want to integrate with ticketing systems like ServiceNow in the future. So this submit for approval is essentially a short circuit today. But going forward, what we'll do is we'll take the design, we'll take the intent, send it up through the chain approval chain of ServiceNow, have somebody approve the changes that they want in the network, come back, all obviously through an API. You come back and you actually go on provision, right? So today we're short circuiting, but in the long term, I think we'll integrate with ServiceNow is, I mean, again, you guys tell me we have ServiceNow Remedy and the other things, but we are targeting ServiceNow as the ticketing application initially. And that's not just for configs. Eventually, I see this product evolving to the point where all the faults, events, and alarms would be raised through ServiceNow as well. Right? So there's a complete integration with the enterprise. Okay. Colin, we can just go forward. Thank you.
So you can view your config at this point. Somebody asked a question as to whether they can verify. Um, this is where you can actually go and verify before you deploy. You, you see this button deploy, but before you hit that button, you can go and look at every aspect of what you have changed. You can look at, go to the switch, look at the configs, look at what's actually happening from a VLAN, BGP, port perspective, VRRP, everything before you deploy. And is it all just in this kind of GUI format, or can it's, I look at the actual configs? You can actually, you can tell it into the box and look at the actual config. Okay. So le let me ask a question. This has come up before. Would it? Would you find it useful for if you click on a switch to take you Telnet right into the box from this GUI, or do you want to do it separately from the product? SSH maybe. Yep. SSH. SSH. <laughs> the box. Yeah, Telnet. No. No. No, no Telnet. I'm sorry. No I meant telnet. telnet, but SSH. Yeah. Okay. Can, can you rephrase your question? Sorry. I just <laughs> okay. You saw how we showed a picture with all the blue switches? Yes. Do you want a feature in which you look at a switch and you say, I want to get into the switch for, from a CLI perspective? Instead of verifying here, you actually, because there's nothing in the box right now, so obviously there's nothing to look at, but eventually when you deploy, the idea is you want to get into the box using this GUI or you want to separately SSH into the box outside of this Well, box. I mean, if you're doing like a dry run and you're taking a look through, and you want to make sure that you know a certain command is on the uh, yeah. is on the box. You know, you, you either have to know what knob it, yeah. it uh, aligns with, or you have to go look. You have to go and look itself at itself and look okay, for the command. Enough. So okay, um, okay, fair enough. Or, or are you asking, can I look at the config before it's even pushed down to well, the box? Well, that's what we're talking about, because this, this is, is the, the config the before it's even pushed down. Actually and you can click a button and see what you can, that you actual... You can see what the changes are. Yeah. You can look at all the changes before you actually deploy. Okay. And after you deploy is what I'm asking. After you deploy, you have to CLI. You can CLI into the box, and I mean SSH into the box and see show run, right? Once you say show run, it'll show everything. I think what we're asking is, can you like see the CLI commands on here? Because when you showed the config, it would just look like the GUI stuff, not yeah. like the CLI config. Not the actual CLI. I believe it'll tell you what knobs are being turned on, uh, not the actual. Do we see the actual CLI box? Oh, oh. Not at the moment. Yeah. So, so we don't have that capability at the moment, but we could certainly look into that. I, I think mean, it's come up a few times yeah, that we talk to customers. Yeah. yeah. Like, I think I've been answering a question. You'll know what knob we're turning on, but the mapping of how we map right. into the I mean, CLI. Right. Like this is like a, sim like a simple example, but if I wanted to check and make sure that my MTU was a certain size, yeah. you know, I'd either have to know where your little knob is on okay. this interface, or I could just go look on, you know, in the in the config and, and see what has been applied. So, or what is set slated to be applied. I Got guess, in this case. No, I, yeah, we'll take that feedback. Yeah. yeah, thank you. Well, and I think some people have made some points too for like troubleshooting too, right? Yeah. You know, being able to see that here. Okay. Other than clicking on it and waiting for all that to pop up. Got you. Yeah, I mean, if if you're going to take somebody to the CLI, right. it should be done with purpose. So if if the if the tool says, oh, there's something wrong with BGP. Don't just drop me to the CLI. It should be like, drop me to the CLI, and then there's a, like, here's the five commands you might want to run right now to troubleshoot this problem. And because you have the context of the information, you can, can di help direct the troubleshooting process. Yeah, no, that makes sense. Actually, I don't know if you're going to show that screen today, but we have something called a switch profile where when you click on a switch, it shows us you know, what's the switch ID, the model number, blah, blah, blah. One of the things is the IP address that we show. So we could easily have a functionality where you click on that IP address and you basically SSH into the box and you know, voila, yeah. right? So we could certainly we, we do that. We could add that. This is yeah. all good feedback, guys, by the way. This is great feedback. Yeah, I mean, if you're trying to make this the controller for everything and yeah. not have people I go into understood. CLIs. Yeah, exactly. Okay. So, Colin, let's go ahead and deploy. All right. So, at this point, what you see is uh, you should see the switches turn green eventually. You. It takes a few minutes to deploy the intent. Wait for it. See the status is in progress. <coughs> All right, at this point, what it's doing is it's going to each switch and essentially sending the commands down. Right, so you, okay, so it's updated a few more things with respect to what the switches are. I think all the configs have been derived now from the intent and then the configs are going through uh, for each of the switches and kind of waiting.
for the stuff to finish, I guess. Yeah, so you, you see a progress bar here as well with respect to, so this is actually done 100%. <coughs> um, once a switch gets a config and it comes back, it's actually going to take the config reboot, come back, respond saying that it's back up with a new config. That's when you'll see the stuff turn back to green, right, for each of the active stuff. Okay, there. So I don't know if you can see the green color very well. It doesn't show, but it... The, the status of the switch shows as green. That means it's an active switch. Active means there's an intent that's been deployed. The switch has gotten the config, rebooted with the intent. And now we should see, if we go into the switches, we should actually see all the config changes that have been made. Oh. OK, so let's see a line to the box. Here you'll see all the commands that have been changed. And Colin's going to show, show the run-in config. And you'll see, you should see a bunch of VLANs, MTUs configured. He had set it to 9,000, which is what NSX needs. And you will see the VLANs that have been configured that you wanted, 16, 12, 16, 13, 16, 14, which is the infrastructure VLANs that he had for NSX. So those have been configured. Uh, yeah. And I think any of the, it's a little hard to see here, guys. I apologize. But the, the, the idea of us going to the CLI is to tell you that you can actually go back, and we, this is a way of verifying that SFD has sent the configs, and uh, those are actually on the boxes. Um, yeah. Okay, can you speak to the SFD? Is it a physical appliance, virtual appliance? Yeah. So right now, it's a virtual appliance. Uh, it's a VM. Uh, uh, we support only ESXi hypervisor from VMware. Um, yeah, but it's virtual right now. There is, depending on as we evolve the telemetry and analytics, we may come out with a hardware form factor just to be able to store all the in, all the data that we collect from the network, but for now it's virtual. Okay. Yeah. Cool. It's just a pre-built OVA that... Pre-built OVA, yeah, and exactly. Plant platform for streaming. It's like you just, it's got Kafka built in. What are you, what are you using for commentary? Uh, what are we using for the... Oh, internally we use a Prometheus DB. Yeah. Okay. 